Historians. I'm your host, Heather Ashley, and welcome to another episode of Women of Her Story, a podcast dedicated to celebrating women who have made or are making their mark on our society. With me, as always, is your favorite waiter from the Olive Garden in your hometown, Steve. What are the specials today? Oh, you know the usual pasta and bread. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Thanks. Any special sauces? <laughs> yeah. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Thanks for asking. <laughs> yeah, we definitely have some. And how are you doing? Um, I'm doing well. I'll have the never-ending breadsticks, please. Oh, great. Yeah. Perfect. We'll get on that. <laughs> Your order is coming. Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> well, today's Her Story lesson sent me on a journey in researching life insurance. And now I'm a little worried that my browser history might indicate that I'm planning something nefarious. Um, you? <laughs> I promise I am not plotting um, a life insurance Okay. Fraudulent I, case. Well, I feel I feel reassured then. Yeah. I'm glad this won't be a Netflix documentary down the line. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Yeah, exactly. We are going to be discussing American businesswoman Bina West and her quest to make life insurance more easily available to women across the U.S. and Canada. Bina West was born in 1867 in rural Columbus Township, St. Clair County, Michigan. Now, there isn't much information, at least not that I could find in my web sleuthing, about her childhood or her early life. But in 1891, Miss West was a 24-year-old school teacher in St. Clair County. During this time, women had very few rights, opportunities for growth, and society placed virtually no financial value on their contributions. They couldn't vote, they couldn't serve on juries, and they couldn't obtain life insurance. For a time, they couldn't even take out policies on their husbands as it was illegal for women to sign legal contracts. So if the husband in the household died while owing money, his life insurance policy would be used to pay the people he owed, and then there was usually little to no money left to give to the widow. That's absurd. Isn't that that's just, that, horrific? That just doesn't even... That just doesn't even... Oh, it I know. seems like that happened so much... Like, so much longer. Like, like, like so much further in the past. Yeah. You know, that doesn't seem like... Th- like that, it, that's absurd. Like it's just like a throwing stone distance away. And here's the other thing that's crazy to me. Think about marriage certificates. That means women weren't even signing the marriage certificate. They had like virtually, they were just owned. They were, because yeah. Because they couldn't sign it saying that we were part of it. Now. That's gross. It's horrible. I was rage researching a lot. I imagine. From 1839 to 1895, states began passing laws that would allow married women shared ownership of property. And other new rules prevented courts from using all of the deceased husband's insurance policies to pay his remaining bills. So... During, you know, in in the time that she was born and, and growing up, things were starting to change. Now, here's the thing. It, it wasn't long before the insurance companies noted a massive increase in the purchase of life insurance policy, policies. In 1839, Americans had $4 million in life insurance. And by 1865, it was close to $600 million. Imagine that crazy that allowing the other half of the hmm. population to obtain life insurance, you end up um, making more money. I'm glad they took note Shocking. of that as if like that was like that. Like, of course, that's what would happen. Honestly. I mean, that's just that's just the next step. That just almost seems like a normal just that that's it seems like a normal thing that should have been implemented. Yeah. But the fact that like. It even had to be done. It yeah, just... it even had to be done just for the bottom line. They're and that like, they took oh, note of it. They were look, like, interesting, look at this increase. And it's like, wow, you don't say. <laughs> you don't say. You're That's... allowing more people to purchase from you? Yeah, yeah. Shocking. Yeah. Hashtag math. Yeah, you I'm, I'm going to put on my my, uh, my enthused, my enthused face. <laughs> like, come on. Of course that's what would happen. So things were looking up, right? Until being a woman became a pre-existing condition. Potential complications from pregnancy and childbirth made it difficult for women to receive policies, and when they did receive them, they were wildly inadequate. 
When the mother of two of Miss West's most promising students died, her eyes were open to how badly the system needed change. There was no insurance on the mother's life, and the father couldn't afford to hire a housekeeper or a nanny, and they had no family nearby. So he just put the children in separate foster care homes and then went on his merry little way. Come on. <laughs> now, I don't know the circumstances surrounding the mother's death, but um, it's always the husband, and it seems a little sus that he, like, immediately put the kids in foster care. Yeah, but that's yeah. just what I'm saying. Yeah. West later found out the fates of these two promising pupils and was devastated. The girl was hired out as a domestic servant, and the boy was sent to work in a, in a library stable. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So this was common because especially at this point in time, the family unit, if the mother died, nobody cared that the husband didn't care about the kids. That's just not what it was. And he was like, well, can't afford a housekeeper, can't afford a nanny. Man. Have fun in foster care. I mean, I guess I'm going to start guess, a new life with a new family. I guess the times were different, but I can't imagine it's not being even that a person. Like, I know. I, well, I mean, according to them, like time, you oh, know, yeah. like back in the day, like this was like a normal thing. But I can't, I can't fathom like doing that now and like trying to legitimize that. It you wouldn't know what be. I mean? Yeah, you it, couldn't even. I don't even. I don't know. I that don't think it's. Wild. I don't think it would be allowed. I think it, they, that, that your kids would have head, to be like taken from. I, yeah, I, I just. Don't know. Uh, yeah, no, not just your head. Maybe I'm grounded. <laughs> <laughs> West wanted to give women something of their own. She wanted to create an organization to aid women in building their net worth, providing insurance for them, and to also serve as a fraternal society of women dedicated to bolstering self-worth so um should we start selling life insurance because this feels really on brand that seems like a cool <laughs> a cool trade for 2021 <laughs> and so the women's benefit association now the women's life insurance society was born in 1892 with 500 dollars in borrowed capital this was one of the first fraternal benefit societies established for and managed by women excellent i know they provided social outlets, assistance, and opportunities to display and develop their unique talents. She emphasized financial support, the home, education, patriotism, recreation, social involvement, volunteer service, and opportunities to expand their horizons. Normalize developing women's businesses and enterprises yes. for women. Yes, yes. And that you know is. what? It just seems so normal. It just seems like a thing that should, it should have happened be forever or, ago. Or if it isn't, like... Now it should just be ten, like tenfold. Well, it's you know making I mean? me think of um, the interview we did last season with Tiffany Monique and she, and her organization called Women Women Funding Women, and it's you know it's kind of like yes. a, they they showcase women who are part of it. Um, it's yeah that that sort of thing, and it mm -hmm. shouldn't be a unique thing. Not that it's not amazing, but I'm saying like it should be just more common practice that that's just something that should exist. Yeah, yeah. And next came time to spread the word. West traveled alone, usually by horse and buggy, around the U.S. and Canada, recruiting women to the society and selling life insurance certificates. She asked women to band together for mutual benefit, entertainment, and expression. Within 10 years, membership was over 100,000. As the society grew, new employment opportunities arose for women in the community. They were employed at the Port Huron Home Office as state managers and deputies around the U.S. and Canada. So not only was this a society to be part of and have a support system, not just financially, but as humans, it also was providing job opportunities that otherwise weren't existing for women in other parts of of society yeah there's a coalition of women for women by women yeah like that's just i love it yeah i'm glad that they were also um opening the doors for each other and providing mm -hmm. opportunities you know mm -hmm. that came and with encouraging the job yeah, yeah. Miss West encouraged the standard insurance rates and reserve requirements to be their guidelines so that insurers could guarantee the funds would be available to pay claims in 1906, West achieved for her own society a million dollar reserve fund. Whoa. I know, 1906. Yeah, million, million dollar dollars. reserve fund. Yeah, I'm sure that was like so much money mm -hmm. back then. The oh Women's gosh. Life Insurance Society still enjoys the benefits of her efforts from her 56 and a half year tenure as chief executive. 
It remains one of the leading financially secure fraternal benefit societies in North America. <laughs> Their assets in 2017 reached $205 million. Eight hundred and fifty thousand eight hundred and forty six dollars. And I always wonder about numbers like this because uh, how terribly specific, like whose six dollars is that? <laughs> and like, why not just like pop that four dollars in to like make it a nice even round? Do you think they round down? Do you think it's like, like, I don't even round know. down from what? I, I don't even know. I don't know. Like, how do you get, how do you get to just I that feel specific like if number? I were treasurer, I would just throw four dollars in and be like, nah, we gotta round this right. out. Right. Because it's like, okay, so do you think they came, do you think they got this number once and they were like, okay, we're good? Or do you think they like counted it like multiple, like, do you think they had to get to this number multiple times? I think they did it multiple were, times. Man. <laughs> And then they're like, yeah, that's I really guess that's really specific it. then. That, that is that number. Who's $6? Yeah, I guess you don't round <laughs> anything. Yeah. It's so tedious. But hey, I guess what else are you doing back exactly. then? Exactly. No, that's not back then. That's 2017. Yeah, I know. I know. Oh, what back then? Doing? Oh, yeah, back in the day. Yeah, like back in the day. Yeah, because it's four years ago. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Their chapters across the United States in 2019 contributed to over $600,000 and volunteered over 50,000 hours of service to charitable causes and individuals in need in their communities. Chapter 837 in Fort Gratiot, Michigan, had to get resourceful when COVID-19 restrictions threatened their annual wine tasting fundraiser for the St. Clair County Child Abuse and Neglect Council. They ended up doing a wine to go event that was socially distant and rather fruitful. Wow, nice. The event received matching funds from Women's Life Insurance Society, and all of the money is going to local children in need. That's that, that's amazing, isn't that it? Is, that is so that's great so... that they were able to still have the event mm-hmm. work around um, the re- you know uh, the, the necessary exactly. restrictions. Exactly, um, I love it. Yeah. I love it, and responsible, and still making sure they're contributing in whatever way they we'll can. We'll go to Michigan sometime. Yeah, we'll, I we'll like Michigan. When, when, when it's cleared up. You oh, like yeah. Michigan? I do like Michigan. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's pretty. Yeah, M&M's from there. <laughs> yeah. True. Yeah. Yeah. D- Detroit's there. There's other stuff there. No, but yeah. No, well, you're right. You know, you're right. You know, that's it. <laughs> Miss West was unsurprisingly a vocal women's suffrage supporter. She represented the National Council of Women of the United States at the International Council of Women in Geneva, Switzerland in 1908. Oh, that's cool. I know. She traveled the U.S., Canada, Europe, and Near Eastern countries spreading the word that women should have the right to vote. She said, women of our society have, by their acknowledged success in the business world, proven their ability to think and act in matters of public importance. Yes, yeah. queen. I just got chills reading yeah, that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at that. <laughs> no, that's that's so good, though. That's, I know. That's so important. Vina West was a respected businesswoman, fraternalist, social worker, and women's rights activist. Michigan Governor Albert A. Sleeper and U.S. Senator Charles E. Townsend attended the dedication of the Society's new home office building in Port Huron in 1917. In 1923, U.S. Senator Hiram W. Johnson of California said to West, Your society has always had my admiration. Its ideals for the betterment of women and the preservation of the home strike a sympathetic chord with us all. The University of Michigan gave her an honorary degree of Masters of the Arts in 1924, citing her courage in pioneering a woman's institution to unparalleled success. The Associated Press named her one of the five greatest women in America, and in 1993, she was inducted into Michigan's Women's Hall of Fame. At the age of 86, Vina West died in 1954 and was described by all who knew her as a believer in womankind and a woman's woman. She had so many accomplishments and, you know, and equally received so many accolades um, Mm. because of those uh, achievements that she, um, that she accomplished in her life. Yeah. And I think, you know, um, it goes, it it shows a lot when she's done something and then years later, she's still still getting the recognition that she, uh, you know, obviously deserves. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's just good that there are people who 
can see the value in the worth in her work. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And because the it's important. And I think also something unique about her is her, her seeing the problems and finding a successful way of addressing them mm -hmm. on $500 of borrowed capital. Yeah. You know, like right. she was like, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to do it the way that I think it needs to be done. Right. And I don't think we hear a lot of stories where there are these women who, you know, are able to, unless they are like born into a certain family where they have, you know, money. Like mm -hmm. there aren't mm -hmm. a lot of stories where like women are, are able to, you know, um, acquire x amount of money in order to like invest it in the community Get which is something of, right, that right, right. we hear more about nowadays but mm -hmm. um i think back then you mm -hmm. know when we heard about it it would be for like or, you know i don't even remember right. it, specifically for like women's stories you yeah. know there might be some but um i think this is an important one for that sure. we we're able to tell yeah well today many women do not have life insurance policies in a study done by the life insurance agency haven life 67 percent of women have a policy while 79 percent of men have one within this study they found that women bought smaller policies than men insuring their lives for about half the amount men insure their lives for the average policy for women was $231,342 compared to $423,102 for men. Those who didn't have a life insurance policy were asked to provide a numerical value for which they would purchase one. The hmm. average for the men's response was $355,348 oh. while women said a hundred and seventy five thousand four hundred and twenty three wow now the I, i'm telling you i went down some crazy holes That's so here. interesting i've never actually thought about it myself how much personally. you would insure your life for how, have you thought about that? well I'll, uh, I'll let me let me oh she's thought about it oh well just because of this research okay okay hopefully so the average incomes <laughs> the average incomes for women in this survey was fifty two thousand four hundred and eighty four dollars while men's was seventy two thousand four hundred and eighty two dollars the traditional rule of thumb for insuring is you're supposed to um, insure yourself for five to ten times what your current income is and women earn less than men and are more likely to take on the role of child caregiver, with 83% of the women indicating that they take on that role, and then 57% of the men saying that they do in the household. So if we go off of income specific, sure. A man's policy, if the woman is, in the, chi is the child care facilitator, should be higher. But I believe this thought process is wildly antiquated life and family roles are way more than income so let's say a woman is a stay-at-home mom we have to take into consideration the value of the unpaid roles that she provides in the home salary.com did a study in 2019 to give their best estimate based on real-time market prices of all the jobs moms perform such as housekeeper, dietitian, daycare teacher, network administrator, social media communicator, recreational therapist, event planner, interior designer, staff nurse, tailor, and more. The medium annual salary is almost $200,000. Okay? This means Damn. that their policies should range <laughs> from 891000 to roughly two million yeah that policy is so because um, think about think like I truly so like you let's before, <laughs> but i really like the way you brought that math into it that was good that was good you brought the you brought the guns out because truly I, like I mean and i and i'm going back to um agreed of you course, know yes. um bina west's students the mother who died the father couldn't afford to hire someone to take care of all the things that she was doing that the mother was doing he couldn't afford it. So, I mean, he took a drastic measure and said, separate the kids, stick them in different boss care, w whatever. It's fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm still mad. I'm a little sweaty mm -hmm. about that. But, no, it's just, it's, it's, it's a very different system 
that should be used to calculate these things than this old one because we have I think women have been told our value is less for so long that we don't even know how to value our contributions within our own households in saying that most women on the average who didn't have a a life insurance policy were like, um, I mean, I guess like what, 180,000, like that's good, right? I'm sorry, honey, no, (laughs) honey, no. And it's, it's. It's unfortunate. It's insane. It's really unfortunate that like it's the the system is is um you know uh seems to work for men um you know in terms of uh, I mean just from start salary, to bottom like that's salary yeah inequality and then easily what women do um you know with work and then at you know just in general um because definitely it's also something more so i realized <laughs> i forgot to list this in the um survey about the life insurance of all the people asked they they asked it, it was it was basically like is your family dependent on your life mm-hmm and every single per- i think it was like 98% said yes and yet They've valued their contributions within that dependence so low that they're not even, they don't even think of it as, as being valued less. They literally value their life less and it does, they don't even bat an eye in the fact that their husband's life insurance is twice, if not three times more than what their, theirs mm-hmm. is. And it's, it's, cause it's different now, like as far as being a woman is in a pre existing condition, except it kind of is sometimes, but with obtaining life insurance. But then, yeah, they're saying that even the women who have them are just so, uh, they're just not enough. And I, I think it's high time that we realize the value of what we're contributing to our households. And, um, I, I think it's I think it's time people start using high time more. <laughs> that's that's one thing. But number two, you're absolutely <laughs> right though. I think the the scales should be balanced. I mean, I feel like you know that's the point of this podcast, and that's just what we hope 2021 in the future will bring is that the the you know the the scale will be tipped in you or know challenging. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we'll, we'll make sure, you know, we'll hope that, um, we can have that equal sort of pay and, um, uh, uh, compensation for everyone's work that Mm -hmm. they end up doing, not just, and then also valuing, you know, unsung hero women. And then considering (laughs) other things within your life. Like I truly had not actually thought about life insurance before. And I listened to, a lot of, you know, true crime podcasts. So you would think I would have thought about life insurance more, but yeah, I know I was, I've been wanting to make a, make a comment, but I was like, no, I need to be serious about this. (laughs) I don't want to break. I didn't want to. It's like, yeah, but the, it's the, not something when, I've when thought about the, for myself. When they take out the life insurance because on, on their the, partner, yeah, yeah, uh-huh. without their That's partner's, what I've been thinking. yeah, mm-hmm. which is different than this one, which is getting a life insurance for yourself. Now but I'm it's not so... even mad. Whenever you hear the story of like the women took the took out the insurance policy on the husband, I'm just now like after <laughs> after hearing this, I'm like, well, you know what? It's probably because like, they're you know, they after all them. these years. I'm like, okay, get yours. <laughs> like, damn, I'm, I'm upset you committed the crime, but like, you know. Yeah, get your money. I, I, <laughs> like I, you know, that's like that's, that's years of not getting your yeah, money. You know I, what I mean? I yeah, absolutely it understand was such that part. Interesting... That's 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 awful. That's like you yeah. get, you need to get your dues. Like dues need to be gotten. <laughs> um, but I'm not condoning any criminal activity. <laughs> He's not telling you to commit insurance fraud. No, no, I wouldn't even, no. <laughs> He's like, I don't even know how to tell someone I to commit insurance even, fraud. <laughs> no, no, you're not getting this guy on that. Uh, no. No, but, it was something where I, I, I hadn't considered that women couldn't get policies before because, and we couldn't even get policies on our husbands because we weren't allowed to sign legal documents. It was just something that truly had not actually entered my mind. So it was really, it was a really interesting one to um, research. I feel, um, I feel enlightened you about feel this topic, partic- particularly because I've, I wasn't too familiar with the concept of um, a life insurance policy in the sense that um, the uh, women's how to calculate it women's individual yeah mm-hmm. women's individuals were that were also lower um, than men in that it was mm-hmm. calculated by salary and how 
messed up, of course, that is. Yeah. But um, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Learning new and being, things. And being a West, though. Yeah. Love she's her. A, she's, a, she's, a, she's a hero. She's a hero. And I'm going to leave you guys with a quote from her. There is nothing unusual about success. I only carried out my ideas. Too many people fail because they are afraid of other people's opinions. Especially this is true of women. The only thing to do is to go ahead. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think you have to push the envelope like that. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? When, you, when, when your purpose is to serve the greater good in this case, I think yeah. it's to like, you know, it's to yeah. create pavement and, you, you know, know push... Uh, proper agenda and i like i like to think that this was said in response to them being like wow you've created a women's society run by women for women you're so successful and she's like it's not unusual to be successful (laughs) like it's not unusual. i just did what i thought i should do yeah and you know, it, you know, it's I mean, like, I feel it's like she was normal, right? Like what I, she was yeah, doing. Yeah. Yeah. She yeah. was seen as like someone who was They're like, Oh, what a radical yeah, women's yeah. life mm-hmm, insurance. Mm-hmm. <gasps> oh my goodness. <laughs> she's a maverick. And she's like, no, I'm just, I'm just doing this. Cause no one's doing a group for women. And, <laughs> and we, we need that now more than ever. Mm-hmm. And we need to fund each other. So, mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. Why are we still talking about this? Can I go? Can I go do this? Can I go? Can I go? Uh, well, Man. Yeah, yeah. All of, you know, uh, this this story has made me uh, just... Open some weird oh, doors for you, right? I was going to say hungry for pasta and bread. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was going Thank to say. Thank you, favorite Olive Garden waiter at In My Hometown, Steve. Yeah, make sure you tip... <laughs> Please. We'll you know, see. I, I brought, the service I, I, was I had okay. good service. You know, I had some zingers. You know, I brought food. <laughs> well, thank you, historians, for tuning in again. Come back this Friday for an interview with award winning screenwriter and novelist Amy McCorkle. In this interview, she talks about her memoir, Letters to Daniel, that is becoming a movie, and it is about living life with bipolar disorder and the many misconceptions surrounding it and other disabilities. She talks about why and how she writes like she's running out of time. She's written like 40 books. It's insane. And she talks about so much more. Nice little Hamilton drop. Yeah. Right there. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Don't forget to subscribe and tell your friends to give a listen so that they can hear these amazing stories twice a week. Follow us on the social media, Twitter at The Her Story Pod, Instagram at Women of Her Story Podcast, and visit our website at OfHerStory.com. Until Friday, be safe, stay healthy, and show the world what you're made of. Wear a mask. Bye. Bye.